Good evening. I wasn't about to stop the guy playing the conch shell. So thank you for, for your patience. Um, that is an amazing jazz combo out there, and they will be performing after, the, um, after Mark concludes his, his lecture, so do please stay if you can. So good evening, my name is Emily Neff, and I am Wyla Dean and Bill Saxon Director and Chief Curator at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. And on behalf of President David and Molly Shiboran and the OU Board of Regents, I'd like to welcome you to the museum. OU, as many of you know, is an innovative place. And as just one example, the Office of the President and the Department of Athletics, did you know Sooner Football is big around here, provide an annual donation that allows the museum to be free to the public. This is not just symbolic. It is truly meaningful to those who otherwise would not be able to visit the museum among the top museums in the state and one of the great university art museums nationally. We are proud of this relationship with our partners and we hope that it will continue long into the future. I'm not going to be able to name all of the generous lenders to the exhibition we celebrate tonight, Macrocosm, Microcosm, Abstract Expressionism in the Southwest, but I do want to thank you as a group, all of the lenders to the show, and express my gratitude for your support of this gorgeous and important exhibition. I'd like to thank Nancy and George Records for their generosity in making the exhibition a reality. And as always, a heartfelt thank you to the hardworking and dedicated staff at the FRED. The staff here is fantastic, and I'm inspired every day by their commitment to sharing art with our public in the most compelling and engaging way possible. And not least, I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Mark Andrew White, Senior Curator and Curator of Collections for conceiving and implementing this splendid exhibition. Dr. White is the Senior Curator and Curator of Collections at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. He received his PhD from the University of Kansas in 1999 after receiving a grant from the Luce Foundation to conduct his research on the late paintings of George Bellows. A specialist in early, American modern, early modern American art, Art of the American West and Native American art. Mark has co-curated or curated nearly every exhibition the Fred has, has hosted, including the recent Art Interrupted, Advancing American Art and the Politics of Cultural Diplomacy, and now his exhibition on abstract expressionism in the Southwest. Would you please welcome Dr. Mark Andrew White. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight and choosing to listen to me talk about art instead of staying home and watching the gubernatorial debate, <laughs> where you will hear nothing about art, I'm sure. Um, I want to say that uh, just briefly, I've been working on this show for four years, almost as long as I've actually been at the museum. And it's fantastic to finally have it be a reality. Um, for the longest time, it, it, it uh, just seemed like it was getting further and further down the road. Uh, and all the research and uh, all the conversations and uh, all of that has finally come to fruition. And so I'm, I'm very happy to see this show installed. And I want to thank Emily as well as the rest of the staff for really helping me to put this together. And I could not have done it without them. And there's a number of you in the audience that I could not have done it without. Uh, so I uh, really, really appreciate it. Now, when we talk about art of the American Southwest, uh, it often brings to mind the art colonies of Taos and Santa Fe, uh, perhaps more independent artists such as Maynard Dixon or Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, rarely would artists such as Louis Reback, Richard Diebenkorn, or Dorothy Hood be associated with the depiction of the southwestern landscape, uh, at least in popular estimation. But those artists, like their artistic predecessors, um, found at mid-century in the distinctive geography of the American Southwest um, also uh, a similar inspiration. Uh, yet they looked to alternative aesthetic means for translating their emotional and spiritual responses to the landscape. In the 1950s, the Southwest becomes a crossroads for artists from the New York School and the San Francisco Bay Area. And you can see here in this map, 
um, how those connections begin to develop in the 1950s as you get artists visiting the Southwest from San Francisco and from New York City, uh, you gradually see a greater uh, and more expansive dialogue between artists in Taos, Albuquerque, Denver, Colorado Springs, uh, Dallas, Houston, as well as Norman, Stillwater, and Tulsa. These artists joins with those of Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas in responding to the expansive land and sky of the American Southwest using the aesthetic language and techniques of abstract expressionism as the style was dubbed by the critic Robert Coates in 1946. The gestural brushwork and color fields of abstract expressionism, or the assemblage of its sculptors, proved effective for translating the monumental terrain, the vivid hues, and the seemingly infinite spans of the region. Um, it's perhaps, perhaps useful in this respect to begin with Louis Reback and his comments upon arriving in New Mexico uh, from Manhattan, where he had spent much of his early career. Uh, he said, I fell in love with the train the moment I hit it, the whole Southwest syndrome. There was something in nature I felt was really great. It was very beneficial for my health and my art. Also the expanse, the mountains, the gorges, the arroyos, the rock formations. And in Red Canyon Rising, uh, a painting that is included in the exhibition, what you see is not a traditional landscape. There's no horizon. Uh, there's really no sense of recessional depth. Um, rather, the painting is about the essential features of the landscape, um, the colors of the sandstone, the, the desert foliage, uh, the sense of, of space, uh, details uh, matched with that seemingly vast expanse. Um, Red Canyon Rising is probably a painting that is inspired by the Rio Grande Gorge, uh, which many of you know from visiting Taos, is very close to the town and served as artistic inspiration not only for Reback, uh, but for a number of other artists. In that respect, a uh, comparison to somebody like Ernest Blumenschein, uh, and this of course is a painting in the Fred Jones collection, in the Atkins collection. In fact, you can walk up and see it, although there's three flights between the Reback and the Blumenschein, so if you can make that jog, you know, all the better. Um, but I would compare these paintings not only because they're not that different in terms of time period, but you can see that Reback was responding to features that Blumenschein was also uh, interested in. Whereas Blumenschein did develop a horizon line, whereas he did interest himself in recessional space, you can see the Rio Grande moving back into space, leading our eye into the landscape. Uh, Reback was interested in a more frontal approach. He was interested in the color, he was interested in the basic forms, um, but his response, his empathetic response to the landscape is no less significant than Blumenschein. Um, what Reback seems to be responding to, as well as so many other artists, is the sort of emotional and spiritual uh, toll that the Southwest took on him. In that respect, it's also important to go to an earlier visitor, Ansel Adams, who visited New Mexico in the 1930s and wrote in a letter to his friend and sometimes dealer Alfred Stieglitz uh, about New Mexico saying, the skies and land are so enormous and the details so precise and exquisite that wherever you are, you are isolated in a glowing world between the macro and micro, where everything is sideways under you and over you and the clocks stopped long ago. What Adams seems to respond to is the vacant yet astounding immensity of the Southwest uh, which led him to pause in contemplation of both the limitless cosmos above and the nuanced variations of the natural world below. Prompted by such ruminations, uh, Adams, as well as this later group of artists, turned inward to contemplation of the self and his or their place in the universe. To some degree, that uh, confusion or conflation between the expanse and the minute detail is what Georgia O'Keeffe referred to when she called it the far away nearby, uh, that collapse of the background and foreground, the way in which space seemed to collapse on itself. Um, and so for O'Keeffe, it was the far away north nearby. For Adams, it was the macro and micro. And for this show, at least, it is also the macro and micro. But as if these terrestrial spaces were not enough, Scientific and technological advances in the post-war era changed perceptions regarding the extent of the universe. The establishment of the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico uh, and then the subsequent establishment of NASA and the space launches, which were organized and controlled in Houston, linked the Southwest 
to the expansion of human knowledge into the microcosmic and macrocosmic spaces of the atom and the solar system, respectively. And so we will talk a little bit about how these artists responded to that expansion of human knowledge. Uh, before I go further, I should probably say a few words about abstract expressionism and its connection to landscape, um, which is not necessarily a new thing that's been done before, but I think the connection of abstract expressionism to the Southwest and how artists responded to the, new, the Southwest is something that is fairly distinctive to this show uh, and one of the things that I hope to achieve uh, in both the catalog and the exhibition. Uh, for instance, when most of us think of abstract expressionism, we think of Jackson Pollock. Um, Pollock, who was raised in the West, although by the time he comes to artistic maturity, has long since left the West, spending his time rather in New York City, uh, did admit in an early interview that I have a definite feeling for the West, the vast horizontality of the land. And many saw in his drip paintings, uh, which were produced actually several years after that comment, uh, the expansiveness of the West. Um, Robert Rosenblum, the critic who often found landscape metaphors in abstract expressionism, would connect Pollock's work not just to the expanse of the West, but also to natural phenomenon. He said, but whether achieved by the most blinding of blizzards or the most gentle of winds and rain, Pollock invariably evokes the sublime mysteries of nature's untamable forces. Um, so it was not just Pollock who found some connection to the West in his own work, but Rosenblum also found natural metaphors in the drips in the sort of seemingly chaotic composition of Jackson Pollock. Uh, perhaps more important to the context of this exhibit are the comments of Clifford Still. Uh, Still actually was an instructor at the California School of Fine Arts in San Francisco and a friend to many of the artists in the exhibition as well as an inspiration and still would define his own uh, artistic inspiration as being one that was connected somehow to metaphors of um, exploration, uh, the, the quest or trek from one space to the next. Um, on the search for meaning in his work, he said, it was a journey that one must make walking straight and alone until one had crossed the darkened and wasted valleys and come at last into clear air and could stand on a high and limitless plain. Here still uses the metaphor of a pioneer looking out over the terrain uh, as yet unexplored and then venturing into that unexplored territory. Rosenblum also could be depended upon to connect Still's work to these landscape metaphors. Uh, for him, the textural um, quality of Still's work, uh, the impasto, the flaking uh, almost uh, um, uh, quality of, of Still's work, uh, inspire Rosenblum to say, Still's paintings seem the product of eons of change and their flaking surfaces, parched like bark or slate, almost promise that this natural process will continue as unsusceptible to human order as the immeasurable patterns of ocean, sky, earth, or water. So with that out of the way, let's talk about some of the artists in the exhibit. Um, I actually begin with one artist that is not in the exhibit, although I had hoped to have the painting in the show, and that's Raymond Jonson's Oil Number no. 13 from 1953. Uh, and on the other side of the screen, you see Richard Diebenkorn's Albuquerque from 1951, uh, which is on loan from the Oklahoma City Museum of Art, and many of you have seen it there, I'm sure. Jonson would not normally figure in this show because he never allowed himself to lose the sort of control, the order that one would find in a Diebenkorn, one of the artists, other artists in the show. But the reason for bringing Jonson in, I think, is that Jonson begins to really embrace the landscape in a non-objective way early in his career. Um, the one thing that you probably can't see from the reproduction is that Jonson has mixed sand, grit, and other aggregates into his paint. Um, the rosy color, almost in imitation of the sandstone of the Southwest, uh, seems to evoke, in this case, a kind of terrestrial metaphor. The black lines that we see have a vaguely anim animate quality, and it's, it's tempting to see them as perhaps responses to membrous pottery or petroglyphs, and certainly that was one of Jonson's inspirations. But I would also like to see them not just as that, but also as cracks or perhaps crevasses, uh, references to fractures in the landscape. Um, and when we see them as both cracks and crevasses, we can see his, his painting as being both small in scope and large. Uh, there is a sense of scale in Jonson that is somewhat confusing, somewhat ambiguous, uh, but I think it helps us to think about this idea of that confusion between the micro and the macro. Now, Diebenkorn had been an instructor, actually, at the California School of Fine Arts. 
and in 1950 he goes to UNM to uh, finish his Master of Fine Arts. Jonesen by that time is um, part-time faculty, he's on the verge of retiring, but Jonesen is the only one that gets what Diebenkorn is trying to do. Um, he becomes really a major enthusiast of Diebenkorn's work and actually at one point um, goes to bat for Diebenkorn when his thesis committee almost refused to give him his MFA. Uh, Diebenkorn, uh, in depicting Albuquerque in this case, uh, was interested not just in any one detail or in a normal view of landscape, one single perspective, but rather in the sort of cumulative total of his experience. Um, all the details, all the um, expanses of empty space, uh, all of it comes into one painting to result in what Diebenkorn himself described as honest to God chaos. Uh, for Diebenkorn, it is his emotional response to the landscape, not something that he expects us to see, not something that we should necessarily try to find in the landscape, uh, but something that he responded to. In that same year, uh, Demon Corn took a different approach to looking at the southwestern landscape. At one point, he takes a, a flight from Albuquerque back to San Francisco to see the Arshel Gorky exhibition at the San Francisco Museum. And as he's taking that plane trip over the southwest, uh, he looks down at the landscape, an experience that so many of us have had uh, at this point, but in 1951 was still relatively rare, um, especially in the southwest. And as he looks down on the landscape, he said, I had never taken a plane trip like that before, flew fairly low over all sorts of country, which was absolutely blew my mind. It wasn't that I went right to the canvas and said, I'm going to paint this, but it went right into the mill and started coming out strong. Diebenkorn was actually taking a, taking a, a uh, flight that increasingly had become one of the marketing aspects of TWA. Uh, TWA was trying to increase their, their um, passenger load through this sort of new experience of the lower landscape. And so here in TWA Flies Direct, they encourage you to look down at the Grand Canyon. Of course, this is a flight you can no longer take. Uh, there was a catastrophic uh, airline accident over the Grand Canyon in the late 1950s. And so after this point, uh, TWA, as well as other airlines, discontinued this. One of Diebenkorn's close colleagues in San Francisco, uh, Ed Corbett, was also an artist that spent some early time in San Francisco, but then moves to New Mexico uh, after some layoffs force him to reconsider his options, um, whereas Diebenkorn decides to settle in Albuquerque. Corbett will join a small but growing community of modernist artists working in Taos. Uh, white painting from 1957 was probably done in Taos or in Mount Holyoke, uh, two very different places, but in some, to some degree it is very much inspired by his experience of space in the Southwest. Um, Corbett talked about how, in fact, the Southwest had informed his early artistic understanding. He had said at one point, I have an emotion about the landscape, the immense changing spaces of mountain and plain. The emotion is important in my life as an artist. I believe moments of significant self-awareness, of imaginative life, were when I became specul speculatively involved with the dramatic nature around me, when I tried to understand the peculiar, almost giddy state of mind caused by seeing a mountain peak 70 miles away in Sonora and the round white clouds just touching it. In the case of white painting, he's responding not to Sonora, but to winters in both Taos and New England, uh, where a heavy blanket of snow obscures almost all detail uh, surrounding the landscape. In the case of white painting, which is a very nuanced painting and something you've got to see in person, trust me, this image does not do it justice, you have a crack. Uh, or a, perhaps a crevice running from the left center down to the right corner. Um, and in that you see very delicate nuances of color. Um, around that the white is, is almost um, piled on as though freshly fallen snow. Um, there's a lot of layering to this painting and it's got a really wonderful surface. Um, the painting uh, in this case responds not just to those winter landscapes um, but also to qualities of silence um, and in that regard suggest introspection. Um, Corbett was not necessarily a practicing Buddhist but he was very interested in the meditative response to landscape and that's something you certainly see in the case of this painting. And just in case 
I, I need to drive the point home, um, you can see a similar response to the winter landscape in one of his contemporaries, Georgia O'Keeffe. And this is her Winter Road number one. Uh, and O'Keeffe too responded to that kind of lack of detail in the winter uh, New Mexican landscape by in this case drawing that single line, that single road as it wound around uh, through the landscape. Now Corbett would have a major influence on other painters including a young Agnes Martin. Um, Agnes Martin is not generally thought of as being an abstract expressionist generally because we know her for her geometric compositions um, but uh, Martin early on starts off working in a very gestural manner and really finds great inspiration in the elder Corbett. Um, Martin spent much of her life in Taos hiking and camping. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the wives of one of the artists in the show, Mary McChesney, told me this great uh, story where at one point uh, everybody had, had partied a little bit too much the night before and um, they'd stayed up playing jazz music and drinking and Agnes uh, the next morning was ready for a hike and couldn't imagine why she couldn't get everybody roused to go up and, and, ha and hike the mountains upside ta outside towels with her. Her untitled that you see here um, responds not only to Corbett's work but um, also, I think, to some of the maps, uh, some of the contours that she saw as she was taking these hikes uh, up and down throughout the mountain ranges uh, surrounding Taos. Corbett's influence also can be found in the work of Beatrice Mandelman. Uh, Mandelman was a transplant from New York. Uh, she and her husband, Louis Reback, uh, come to Taos in 1947 and really become the nucleus of a modernist community there. And it is really the influx of artists like Agnes Martin, Ed Corbett, and others from San Francisco that really push and encourage Mandelman and Reback to grow and to really embrace abstract expressionism. Um, her winter is an interesting uh, image, one that is uh, very much also inspired by the winter landscape, but also that sense of confusion, bewilderment uh, that one finds in a heavy blizzard. Here she is taken to drawing um, lines, shapes, uh, elements of, of identification that one might take, landmarks perhaps, uh, in terms of the painting. And the largely white image uh, really does require, in this case, to give us a point of reference, uh, these lines, these shapes, uh, these geometric uh, forms. But I would also, as I did with Corbett, once again, connect her to an earlier generation of Taos artists. Uh, for instance, Victor Higgins' Stream in Winter is also interested in that sort of blanketing effect, that, that um, almost incomprehensibility that a heavy snow uh, creates in viewing the landscape. And yet in this case we have just that one course of water, that stream that helps us to orient, to find our bearings. Uh, and so winter for Mandelman uh, had a very similar effect uh, in, and except that in the, her case she tries to give us not just the representational point of view but something that is, is non-objective, something that is about emotion, something that is about perceptual experience but one that is not tied to details, one that is not tied to um, a certain type of viewing of the landscape. Now with Robert McChesney, another of their colleagues from San Francisco, because the painting is white, you might think, okay, well he's going to talk about winter again. Well, not so much. Um, McChesney's uh, work at this point deals more with the terrestrial surface. Uh, the arena series is so noted because it includes a lot of sand aggregates and types of grit. Um, he would pour the sand onto his canvas and then allow the paint to flow between the sand um, as though it were sort of a, a, um, a kind of metaphor for lava as it spreads throughout the land. Um, for, in McChesney, what one finds are these metaphors for um, tectonic forces, volcanic forces, the long, slow change of landscape in New Mexico. And of course, McChesney, like so many others, knew that New Mexico had been shaped over the centuries, first by that cataclysmic explosion of that mega volcano that had shaped the landscape and littered it with lava rock that had created the mountain range, but also then the centuries following of erosion by wind and water. And so as the paint flows through McChesney's uh, sand, he references in sometimes literal and sometimes uh, metaphorical ways how the land is shaped uh, over the centuries. For the Texas sculptor Charles Truett Williams, uh, that geological history uh, provided his, an essential medium uh, 
Williams begins visiting Taos in, in, 19, in the 19, early 1950s. In 1951, is compelled to pick up a piece of the lava rock that he finds outside of Taos and to sculpt, in this case, the work Lava, uh, a biomorphic sculpture that owes a debt to Jan Arp, um, but also is, is at the time, uh, a very sort of, of experimental way of thinking about one's medium and, and how one can derive a form from it. Um, of course, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that uh, volcanic rock is not something that is easy to shape, is easy to smooth, and yet this work has a, a perfectly smooth texture um, and, a, and an almost immaculately rounded form. Um, so this took a lot of, of hard work uh, to keep from breaking the stone, to chipping away at it, um, rather to kind of give it this sort of biomorphic form, one that seems to evolve and shape before our eyes. In that respect, the geological um, also influenced Reback in other ways. Uh, we saw his Red Canyon rising, but his work suspension aesthetically has a very different appearance, but is still also a very intriguing work. Uh, what we see in suspension are voids, cavities, uh, forms that could be identified as um, empty space or as perhaps forms on a landscape. Are we seeing suspension uh, as if we are seeing the landscape from above. Are we looking at a rock wall? It's hard to say, actually. Um, I think one comparison we could make are to the tufa formations that one finds in Bash Bandelier National Monument near Los Alamos. Uh, those strange formations that were formed by petrified volcanic ash that have been hollowed out by the wind and water over the centuries uh, to the point that you have a rock that looks very much like a sponge uh, or some other sort of more porous uh, form. But if we saw it just as landscape, that might perhaps be the, the uh, limiting the painting too much. Uh, certainly, uh, we could see it in other ways. We might see it as being connected to the microcosmic spaces of the atom. Um, and that's not necessarily a leap. Certainly, at least, Los Alamos National Labrador Laboratories didn't think so when they used the painting in an ad in 1961 to advertise their laboratories in hopes of attracting the best and brightest. Um, as they said in their ad, they wanted us to see that contemporary education, like contemporary art, continues to find expression in new areas. And so they used uh, modernist painting from the Taos and Santa Fe and Albuquerque artists to advertise Los Alamos, to suggest that art was, was uh, breaching frontiers just as science was breaching frontiers. Now, these competing, even conflictual, ideas of space in Reback's work are arguably the result of the immensity of space itself. Space was often, to Reback and others, um, confusing, bewildering. Um, how did one make sense of the Southwest in paintings that could arguably uh, be only so large? Um, but he wasn't the only one. Elaine de Kooning the artist from New York, the wife of Bill de Kooning, a uh, critic and artist in her own right, uh, also had a difficult time contending with the Southwest and its distinctive geography. Uh, her work changed radically upon her visit to New Mexico in 1958. The expanse of the land gave her work a horizontality and a vivid palette that it lacked in New York City. As she said at one point, when I went west, the color experience of New Mexico convinced me that feeling was the thing. Nowadays, when an artist discovers the sky, it's like a bride who has never done any housework raving about her first vacuum cleaner. It's just not news. However, there were the skies and the twilights, and they were inescapable and tremendous. For de Kooning, uh, her response is one that is almost kaleidoscopic as she tries to contend with the varied nuances of light in Albuquerque and the way it reflects off the adobe buildings, the asphalt of the street. Uh, she is given to a frenetic activity, one that is very gestural, uh, one that attempts to express not only that instantaneous response, but also the lingering emotion of her experience. Um, Albuquerque, which is the first painting you see as you walk into the exhibit, is in many ways sort of the touchstone for much of, of this show. Um, de Kooning tries to make sense of, of her, con her confusion, her, the ambiguity that she finds there. And I should say that she produces a number of paintings in the Southwest, most of which we can't find. 
Uh, Oklahoma also inspired Elaine de Kooning when she visited. Uh, the painting that you see there in the lower right is the only reproduction that I know of of this painting called Oklahoma. It's eight by eight feet, uh, so very comparable to the painting you'll see in the exhibit. I sure, I'm sure a similar palette, even though I only have the black and white. Uh, and I have looked high and low for this painting and have of yet not found it. Now, in fact, de Kooning was in Oklahoma because of her friend and dealer, Dord Fitz. De Kooning meets Dord Fitz in 1957, actually at his invitation to show with him in, at his gallery in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, Fitz had gone to New York. He had, had visited with many of the major members of the New York School, not just Elaine de Kooning, but also Jean Raynal, uh, Milton Resnick, Franz Klein, uh, Willem de Kooning. Uh, he gets to know many of the major remaining members of the New York School at that time, and he convinces several of them to have a show in Amarillo in 1957. Um, thereafter, he manages to convince Elaine de Kooning, as well as Louise Nevelson, um, Milton Resnick, as well as other artists, to come to Amarillo to hold workshops, not only in Texas, but also in western Oklahoma. There was a point at which modernism had more visibility in the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas than it did in much of the country. Hard to really imagine at this point, um, but that such is the case. Now, Dord Fitz was not only inspired by his interaction with the New York School, but also by the Texas landscape. Uh, two paintings, The Way from 1956 and Gathering One from 1957, belong to a series uh, in which he investigates, um, on one hand, bursts of energy, whether we could describe them as solar, nuclear, or perhaps otherwise, against a subtly modeled field of color. But I would also argue that he was uh, inspired to some degree by the high plains, that flat, insistent horizon that one finds in Amarillo, and of course the blazing sun above. Um, I would also say that Fitz was not just inspired by the landscape, but also by events of a somewhat unexplained nature as he looked to the skies, much as other artists, in this case, UFOs. Um, as Fitz was working in, in 1957, you must remember that it was the heyday of unexplained um, visitations from the uh, cosmos. And in fact, there was one such very famous, or at least it was at that time, uh, UFO visitation in Leveland, Texas. Now, I guarantee you most of you don't know where Leveland is, and you have no reason to know where Leveland is. But for those of you that do, good for you. I actually lived there when I was two for about four months. Um, <laughs> And I'm glad it was when I was two as opposed to 22. Um, but as you see here, one of the news reports of fiery objects reported in wide area over Texas. Um, one of the things that made the Leveland sighting so significant is that it wasn't just one person out on their farm uh, with nothing to, no one to, else to corroborate. Uh, not only did you have a number of sightings around town, uh, but many police officers that also corroborated the story. Um, so gathering one with its multiple bursts of light, uh, especially the red one and the bursts of light that were seen over the skies of Leveland were often described as being red, orange, and then going white. Uh, perhaps Fitz was also thinking about, in this case, uh, the UFOs. And he was uh, very much a UFO enthusiast, so there's a, uh, quite a bit of probability that this is one of the inspirations for this painting. Now, Fitz was not just interested in promoting the New York School or in his own career. Uh, he promoted a number of artists within the region. For instance, he promoted two artists, uh, one from Colorado, one from Oklahoma. Uh, Charles Bunnell, the painter from Colorado Springs, was one of Fitz's favorite artists. And really, to some degree, Bunnell owes his success as an artist almost entirely to Fitz. Um, Bunnell had been a representational painter until the 1950s uh, when his friendship with Jackson Pollock uh, really pushed him to non-objectivity. Uh, by the late 1950s, uh, he be becomes very interested in uh, looking not to necessarily the landscape, but to the cosmos above, um, or at least in this respect of the painting you see here, Texas Dawn, to the sky. Uh, standing on the high plains around Amarillo, uh, he looked at the sunrise and was given, in this case, to depict um, a really radiant sunset, uh, one that encourages a kind of almost transcendental spiritual response. 
Uh, as Fitz said about Bunnell's work, in Charlie's paintings, color, shape, texture, tone, and line move endlessly in a lyrically ordered manner across the vast expanse of the magic planes of spirit. Even though many of Bunnell's paintings were often small at 16 by 20 inches, although I would say that Texas Dawn is, I think, of 36 by 36, uh, Fitz could see in these small paintings a vast expanse of space. Uh, so even in the small painting, depending on how the artist approached the canvas, uh, one could find immensity. He also promoted the Oklahoman J.J. McVicker. Uh, McVicker was the head of the, head of the department at Oklahoma State University, and Fitz was very interested not only in showing McVicker's work and having him to Amarillo uh, to give lectures and workshops, but also took him to New York and introduced him to the New York school there. Um, McVicker, in his painting number five, a painting that up until recently hung in my office. Uh, I, I can't help it, I love the painting. So, uh, painting number five is one of McVicker's responses to, to nature. Uh, McVicker had been a landscape painter uh, or a printmaker for much of his early career, but by the 1950s, he, like many of the artists in the region, began to look to non objectivity and abstract expressionism for inspiration. Uh, painting number five. Uh, it contains a series of very focused, concentrated strokes, um, almost, almost frenetic in their arrangement, um, surrounded in this case by a delicately nuanced uh, white, uh, one that uh, occasionally gives peaks of, of yellow and blue from beneath. Uh, for McVicker, I would contend, uh, once again, winter was a response, the winter on the high plains. But McVicker was also interested in cosmic themes as well. He was interested in ideas of an expanded awareness. Uh, a practitioner of yoga and meditation, he often thought about a focal point and then allowed his mind through that focal point to expand and ruminate on ideas of an expanded awareness. Um, and so painting number five, as much as it might have to do with the landscape, also has to do with this idea of the cosmos and the vast expanse of the universe. Fitz also, uh, also exhibited artists such as the Fort Worth and then later on Houstonian uh, Jack Boynton. Boynton was also an artist that was uh, showing in Taos and was uh, good friends with many of the artists that I've shown you already, like Reback, Mandelman, Corbett. Uh, and so Boynton is also one of these, these really interesting points that creates connections between the disparate artists uh, in the Southwest. Um, as, you, as you move through the exhibit, increasingly you find that there is a great deal of community uh, despite the long distances between places like Norman and Taos. Now Jack Boynton begins working with archetypal forms, dealing with the sort of elemental forces of the Southwest. Uh, Thunderstorm from 1955 is uh, a painting that is on the verge of representation. We can see in it uh, perhaps a cumulonimbus cloud rising into the dark sky. We can see flashes of lightning striking the high plains. And yet he's also concerned with that breakdown in space, that conflation of the macro and micro. There is no middle ground here. Rather, he's compressed it. He's, he's, ref he's uh, responded to that collapse um, of space that one finds in the Southwest in interesting ways. And he also thinks about nature in these sort of, of monumental terms. Douglas McAggie, who was the director at the California School of Fine Arts and brought together talents like Diebenkorn and Corbett and Clifford Still, uh, later moves to Texas to take on the directorship of the Dallas Contemporary. And while there, uh, he writes one of the first major books on, on Jack Boynton. And in that, he also describes that sense of space. He says, at first, seeming to compose an object, the expertly ridged and spavined units become, in contemplation, transformed to take part in an inner place of mass and space on a grand scale. There is no middle ground. It is an odd ambivalence. In effect, the far and the near are indivisible. A prior inkling of this paradoxical drama has already been glimpsed in Thunderstorm. And so in Thunderstorm, McAggie, like so many others, found that far away nearby, that, that conflation of the macro and the micro. Boynton would again explore those ideas in Outpost, um, one of his largest paintings, in which you have, in this case, um, that sort of almost archetypal solar disk rising over a landscape that seems at once um, earth, uh, foliage, 
even muscle and sinew. Um, it is a painting that is very textural. It feels almost as though it was made of the southwestern mud itself. Um, and it looks as though it very much belongs in the southwest. Uh, but in that work, you see that collapse of the near and the far. Now, Boynton, in, 1950, uh, in 1957, would leave Dallas-Fort Worth and move to Houston, where he joined uh, a growing and vibrant community of artists uh, working in what was, at that point, uh, one of the largest and most cosmopolitan cities in Texas, and arguably still is. Um, Boynton was, uh, became good friends and ultimately shared a studio with Richard Stout, who also returned to Houston, uh, having been born in nearby Beaumont. He comes back after studying at the Art Institute of Chicago, where he had the opportunity to see major works by de Kooning, by Pollock, and his response to the southwestern environment, even as he's living in Chicago, is this painting, Landscape with White Sky, from 1956. Uh, landscape with white, spot, white sky also collapses that space in a way very similar to Boynton uh, or to Reback or to Diebenkorn or any of the other artists that we've talked about. Um, what we have here is a uh, really interesting gestural passage, to, passage towards the lower portion of the canvas and then an expanse of white above, suggesting it at once um, a great deal of, of detail um, towards us and then yet that sort of expanse moving off into space. Um, Richard Stout, I should add, is going to be here on October 16th to talk about the Houston modernist community in the 1950s and 1960s. And he'll be sharing with us his reflections, not only of artists like Jack Boynton, but many other figures that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of minutes. And if you can come back for that, I, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, we only have four uh, living artists in, in the show um, that, uh, and I, I think if we have the opportunity to listen to any of them, uh, we should uh, take the opportunity to do so. I should also say that Jim Hinkle, who's in the show, is, is here tonight. So thanks, Jim. I appreciate you being here. Um, Boynton was friends with not only Stout, but also Dick Ray. Uh, Dick Ray uh, really has a strong modernist education when, in fact, he leaves the Southwest to go to Europe where he sees art informel and art brut uh, in Paris, but also in Denmark. He becomes very much interested in European modernism in general. Um, his painting, Green Grass Man, from 1961, is an incredibly textural work and something you have to see in person. Um, he created it through uh, superimposing one canvas on the other and then painting over both uh, to create a, a, um, a composition that seems to in some ways texturally reproduce the contours of the land, um, the, the scratching of grass uh, in, in a otherwise um, kind of barren land. Um, but what I think is, is, is fascinating is that on one hand he manages to quote uh, the Italian painter Alberto Burri uh, in, his, in one of his Sacco paintings where he used burlap and other coarse canvases uh, to create those textural juxtapositions. And yet he manages to bring it also back to the Southwest uh, to think about landscape in Texas. Uh, the title of this is, is somewhat ambiguous. Uh, one might think initially, green grass man. Well, what's a green grass man? But I would suggest that it's not necessarily a green grass man, but he's using the colloquial of the day, green grass man. Ray, Boynton, Stout, and others were supported uh, quite actively by a, by a community of critics and other interested parties, collectors, uh, that really supported um, modernist growth in Houston. Uh, for instance, Jermaine McAggie uh, comes from the Palace of uh, uh, the Legion of, of Honor in San Francisco, where she had been one of the first to really recognize the import of abstract expressionism, giving Clifford Still one of his first shows, um, giving uh, other shows to many of the important members of the California School of Fine Arts, like Corbett and, and Diebenkorn. Uh, she is brought to the she's brought to Houston by Dominic de Manil. Uh, in order for, for Germaine to run the Contemporary Arts Association, which was at that point really the primary, primary organization showing contemporary art. Um, 
eventually Germaine will actually lose her contract at the CAA and then transfer over to the U University of St. Thomas uh, where she is a professor of art history and in fact heads that department until her untimely death in 1964. Um, in fact, um, some of you may know, but I think many of you probably don't know, that the Rothko Chapel that has now become so famous and is a tourist destination now in Houston was actually conceived of as a tribute to Germaine and McAggie uh, after her death. But it's not just Germaine and Dominique de Manil who are helping to encourage modernism in Houston, but also the arrival of James Johnson Sweeney. Uh, James Johnson Sweeney comes to uh, the, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in 1961 and will really usher in a great period of growth as well as a real investigation of modernism uh, in the MFA. And, and, and I would say, and, and perhaps Emily would be able to say even better, that uh, Sweeney's influence uh, is still very much with the MFA. Um, apart from some of the artists I've already mentioned, uh, you have later on the arrival of Dorothy Hood. Um, Hood spent much of her early career from 1941 to 61 in Mexico. But upon returning to Houston, she becomes very interested in the Southwest and especially the perspectives the Southwest offers her to look at the night sky as well as the day uh, and to think, to imagine, to dream about the celestial. Uh, Hood becomes very interested in what lay beyond the earth and she begins to create a number of paintings over the next 30 years that explore the cosmos. Um, as she will say in sometimes very cryptic comments, um, the cosmos really is her inspiration and her paintings are almost a vehicle for thinking about and expanding human awareness and thought beyond the terrestrial realm into the astral. Uh, she says at one point, light is the measure and the return of the gift of magnetic fields. Space extends itself over and is the breath of every essence. The eye is our own earthly right of possession of the cosmic orbs. Um, to paraphrase, what she means is, by looking up, we can somehow make the cosmos a part of ourselves. We can internalize it, um, either emotionally or spiritually. Uh, we can find inspiration in it, and in so doing, we become more, uh, we become greater, we become part of the cosmos itself. Uh, the painting that you see in the show is The Blessings of Gravity from 1994, uh, a painting that up until recently uh, had been dated 1970s, uh, and so it's the latest painting in the show. And unfortunately, um, it still works perfectly for the show, but it was a little past the time period that I was generally thinking. But still, it offers a way of thinking about how Hood, in this case, related to the cosmos. Um, as one would, would think, uh, in the late 1960s, space was not only on Hood's mind, but mi the minds of many Americans. Not only did you have the release of 2001, A Space Odyssey, in 1968, um, a film that continues uh, to really, I think, impress, amaze, and intrigue audiences. But of course, you also had the landing on the moon of Apollo 11 in 1969. And I think it's possible not to think just of the moon landing, but also the numerous space launches that gave us photographs in the 1960s of outer space, the Earth, uh, and celestial bodies. Of course, one could argue that that had begun much earlier in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik, uh, which was not only a shock uh, to, the, to most Americans, but also a fascination. And so you have a number of Americans looking up in 1957 in the night sky to try to see the satellite that the Soviets had shot into space. The U.S. responded quickly with Explorer 1 in January of 1958, and by 1960, 20 satellites had been shot into space. It is unsurprising then that other artists might respond to all of these orbiting bodies, uh, not just the ones we were familiar with, but these new technological innovations. Um, Dwayne Hatchett, the Oklahoma sculptor who had studied at OU, but then goes to the University of Tulsa to teach, uh, responded to Sputnik in 1960 with his own Sputnik, number one. Uh, never mind that it looks more like a spaceship from Flash Gordon than it does the spherical object that actually was orbiting the Earth. Um, Hatchet was very interested in flight. Uh, he had been a fighter pilot in World War II, and flight would continue to amaze him for much of his career. In the 1950s and 60s, they're not the only ones thinking about space, not only in reality, but in the abstract. 
The Denver painter, Vance Kirkland, uh, also uses the night sky and the imagined world of the night sky as inspiration. Uh, Kirkland had been uh, a well-known surrealist, not only in Colorado, but also in New York, where he was routinely showing at the prestigious Nodler Gallery and was showing with surrealists, including Max Ernst. Uh, but in the 1950s, he begins to renounce representation. He begins to move away from the representational. Um, and in order to not belabor himself with the Colorado landscape, the Rocky Mountains, that he said had ruined so many artists, uh, he begins to look upward from a vantage point high in, in elevation. Uh, as Kirkland said at one point, I had reached a point where I did not want to spend any more of my time looking at nature. I had to rise above it and beyond it. I took myself up and away from the landscape because I thought at the time, at least the sky is very clear and I can paint farther away. In 1959, when I started doing explosions in space, I was excited about it because I was making abstractions that were explosions as an idea. Nebula near Mars from 1959, of course, does not depict anything that actually exists. We know that there is no nebula within our solar system. Rather, what Kirkland is thinking about is not the contemporary, but the cosmic history of the universe. It's slow, deliberate evolution from a point of, of chaos to a gradual point of formation. Um, for him, it is as much the imagined as the reality. Using an oil and water technique, he created uh, very viscous passages on canvas that suggest gaseous forms uh, coalescing, congealing, becoming something else. Uh, there is always a state of flux, a state of, of uh, chaos becoming order in Kirkland's work, uh, one that he imagined as he saw the night sky. For Oklahomans, it was not so much the cosmos as the sky above us uh, that inspired uh, the artists here in Norman uh, and in Stillwater. Uh, as I think most of us would agree, the sky is a very ever-present uh, phenomenon in Oklahoma. Uh, we feel like we live in a sort of big sky country um, where one can always see quite a bit of, of the dome above us. Um, this was certainly an inspiration to the head of the School of Art, John O'Neill, uh, John O'Neill spent much of his career at OU, and from 1951 to 65, he was here uh, as the, the uh, chair of the department. It is only in 1965 when he is courted by the likes of Dominique de Menil and others that he goes to Rice University in Houston, where he makes a connection with artists like Dorothy Hood, um, Richard Stout, uh, and Jack Boynton. In the 1950s, O'Neill begins painting what he calls distillations of light and color. He becomes very interested in these passages of light because, as he says, light is an expression of life. Um, to, is to lose it or to lack it is to die. And so he begins to paint uh, images that seem to depict perhaps landscape, perhaps other recognizable phenomenon, but faceted as though stained glass uh, into passages of color. His protege and fellow faculty member Eugene Bavinger, who had at one time studied with O'Neill, and then O'Neill actually convinces Bavinger to come back, um, or he's one of the figures that convinces Bavinger to come back and teach at OU, uh, follows suit with a painting like Atmospheric. Um, in Atmospheric, Bavinger is also painting uh, these, these flickering uh, moments of color and light, but for Bavinger, it's not so much the object or light itself as change, flux, as um, he will also say, his work is about a kind of suggestion of space. Nearly all of my work from the very beginning of my concept about nature, I have to get that feeling that when you see a piece of color, you realize that if it were to extend, it might go considerably outside the limitations of the canvas. So you're only seeing a part of it, of a larger point. Um, so for Bavinger, it becomes really about these, these fluctuations of light and color, that, that, that change, that continual change that is really part of our experience of everyday life. Um, Bavinger was, like other artists in the New York School, attempting to combine Impressionism with Abstract Expressionism as though taking the, the dots out of George Seurat's paintings and giving them their own life. Um, you might compare, for instance, Bavinger's work to that of Bradley Walker Tomlin, um, who in his number eight was also thinking about how light and its change determines our impression of things. <clears throat> 
Babinger uh, also, however, was very much interested in change in a more kind of demonstrable way. His red earth is a massive canvas in which he took an expanse of red paint and poured on it a solvent, allowing it to erode that surface to create gullies, um, uh, streams, courses uh, of thinner paint. Um, the experience of looking at red earth is, is like looking down at the landscape. And of course, Babinger was, like Hatchet, a pilot. Um, he had worked for the Air Force, or he had, he had served in the Air Force during World War II and continued to be a pilot after his service. Um, and I should point out that for uh, lay pilots, for um, amateur pilots, um, the Southwest is, in fact, the nexus of a um, skyway, as it was called, Oklahoma City being, in fact, one of the focal points of that skyway. And so for Babinger and other pilots, the Southwest was something that they were used to seeing from above. But I would also argue that Babinger, uh, in his interest in change and flux, the erosion, is thinking about uh, contemporary uh, applications to the landscape. Uh, Robert Smithson, at this very moment, is also thinking about how one changes the landscape, how one shapes it, how one changes it aesthetically. He's interested in entropy, um, the slow, gradual change, the descent into chaos that happens in systems. Uh, this is a drawing that is actually in our collection and is in the hallway outside the exhibit, so I encourage you to stop and look at it. His asphalt and eroded cliff, in which he imagined pouring into a, the eroded side of a hill a truck full of asphalt and how it would course and flow down the hill almost like a Pollock painting uh, made out of tar and, and, and grit. Uh, unfortunately, the reality didn't actually happen that way and it sort of slid down in a big mass. You can see it online. It, it looks more, a lot more aesthetically pleasing in this drawing, I assure you. One of the things that had Babinger thinking of the landscape so much was perhaps living in the landscape. Uh, most of you know of the Babinger House uh, that was built for Eugene and Nancy Babinger by Bruce Goff, completed in 1955. Uh, the Babinger House was um, a house built on a concentric spile that was in many ways very much open to the environment, uh, not only literally in some cases, but figuratively through the generous use of glass. Um, but the landscape around the Babinger House also had a pr profound influence on Babinger. And he then took to um, changing that landscape, uh, to creating a, a sense of space that was um, not just one from a casual walk, casual stroll through the woods, but one that had a kind of aesthetic significance to it. Um, and so he joined with his friend, Charles Williams, who we saw earlier, um, to create several works that might aesthetically shape the space around the Babinger House. Uh, one such piece is, is sort of whimsically titled Stonehenge, in which Williams and Babinger took uh, several pieces of, of large, uh, heavy stone to create that post and lintel uh, reminiscent of the well-known Stonehenge in England, but one that would give the landscape a kind of metaphorical age, something uh, that, that suggested antiquity, uh, the passage of time, and the slow sort of, of change of things, not just nature, but also meaning. Um, it's gradual loss over time, uh, something that would suggest that, that kind of um, ambiguity that we all find in the actual Stonehenge. Now, the Southwest inspired um, in these artists and others considerations of time and place in an ever-expanding cosmos. They responded metaphorically to the geology and climate with idiosyncratic brushwork and with color and with the hope of capturing something of the ineffable essence of the region. And they succeeded, at least in my opinion, in enriching the cultural history of the American Southwest. Thank you. I went over by 10 minutes, and so I deeply apologize. Um, I, can take, um, I can take two, possibly three questions if they're quick, and I would be happy to answer anything else, but I want to make sure that you get out to hear the music, to enjoy the food, to enjoy the exhibit. Um, if you're going to ask a question, um, we will need to have your response recorded on microphone, um, so Michael will run over to you. Okay, any questions? <laughs> 
I, I cannot have been that clear. Come on. <laughs> Surely somebody's got it. Wait just a second. Let, let Michael get to the get to you. Sorry, we, we're recording, so we want to make sure that we've got everything. <laughs> I was curious to know that, uh, Johnson, how big was that canvas? Uh, that canvas is 36 by 48. It's a good size. Other questions? Uh, what is the location of the Bavinger House? Oh, boy, that's a complicated question. Um, it is to the east of Norman, but um, as um, not to go into the, the controversy over this too much, the Bavinger House was largely destroyed uh, several years ago uh, by a fairly serious storm that hit Norman. Um, it was, um, the damage was exacerbated uh, after that, uh, and so it is a house that Whereas I think that some of the structure still exists, it is not even close to being in its former condition. Um, if you want an experience with the Babinger House, coincidentally, uh, we have a holdover from our exhibit on Bruce Goff back in 2010. We have a digital recreation of both the exterior and the interior, and it is um, on the television screen adjacent to the uh, macrocosm, microcosm exhibit. Um, but unfortunately, it's been closed to the public for a long time, and it is doubtful that it will ever be habitable or even possible, capable of being visited again. Okay, I'm going to cut it off there so you can go out and have some deviled eggs and some garlic olives and all that. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.